method. So if you want to watch it later, you won't, you can. So excellent. Um, good afternoon to everyone who's joined us for this book talk. My name is Keris and I'm the arts coordinator for the Royal Overseas League, which is a not-for-profit membership organisation with over 16,000 members all over the world. We are very lucky to have our beautiful London Clubhouse, which has places for our members to eat, drink, relax and stay, but we're even luckier to have our amazing concert hall and exhibition space, which are the main stages for our arts programme, which has been a big part of the Rosal life for over 70 years. I have the great pleasure of introducing our writer today, Henry Edmondson, who has been trekking and climbing in the wider Himalayan area for over 50 years. He's a graduate of Pembroke College, Cambridge, and a member of the Alpine Club, the Himalayan Club, and a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. Tales from the Himalaya is his second published non-fiction book. So Henry will be taking questions at the end. So do submit a question in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen anytime during the talk. Um, copies of his book are also available online at your or at your local booksellers. Um, but you can also directly purchase them from his website and I'll put the link in the chat box as we get started. So that's all from me and I'll hand over to Henry. Thank you. Thank you, Karis. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for I'm going to be describing my book, Tales from the Himalaya, which is uh, a historical narrative of four interlink interlinking topics. And the topics are Tibetan Buddhism, the geology of the Himalaya, the politics of the Himalaya, and the societal issues in the Himalaya. And they're, they're remarkably interlinked. And they're, the inspiration for all these uh, topics comes from the travels that I've made uh, since I was a young man in the Himalaya. And here you can see uh, the White Stars uh, uh, climbing expeditions starting in 1965. And the lines are uh, month long treks that my wife and I have been doing for the last several years um, to the extent that we've almost completely traversed the whole of the Himalayan chain. Uh, our last trek was in 2019 in Eastern Nepal. The, uh, the writing in the book is inspired very much from mainly the people that we meet and we employed during these treks. And for Mountain Lover, which uh, of course is the case with, with us, uh, there's really nothing to beat, uh, fine weather, uh, having climbed a high coal, coming down and knowing that you can get down into the valley and have a little bit of a rest. This is in the Sola Kumbu area of Nepal, quite near Everest, and uh, everything uh, seemed very, very uh, pleasant, but unbeknownst to us, something very serious was going on underneath our feet. Uh, this is April 2015. And the next day, when we descended a little bit into the villages, we witnessed firsthand the most almighty earthquake that happened in 2015. It killed numerous people at the Everest base camp. And before our very eyes, uh, houses came tumbling down like this one, uh, dry stone walls simply collapsed. Uh, people were killed. Uh, it was mayhem. Uh, and so the first thing we did was to uh, check on the families of the Sherpas and the porters that were helping us uh, fortunately, they were all fine. And then it was a matter of uh, making our exit uh, to Kathmandu, which took another uh, week's walking to get to the nearest roadhead. In Kathmandu, uh, it was even worse in places. It was very uh, localized. And by the time we got there, uh, there were international uh, rescue crews with their dogs roaming all over the place for um, survivors of the disaster. And uh, in, in total, uh, I believe about 10,000 people were killed. Um, this shows you uh, on the right, uh, the result of, uh, there's a very historic area in Kathmandu called Durbar Square with, with many ancient temples, uh, on the whole, totally destroyed, as you can see in that picture. But if you go back in time, uh, and Patan is a neighboring town to Kathmandu, another royal town uh, historically, uh, also with its Durbar Square, you can see that was destroyed also in 1934. And indeed, there are earthquakes happening up and down the Himalayan uh, chain continuously. 
uh, and they're documented since medieval times in Nepal, um, at least uh, that far back. Now, our Sherpa, Fudo, up. And that was why the earth shook, why the earth around us rose by exactly one meter. Everest is now one meter higher than it used to be. And as far as he was concerned, that was a perfectly valid explanation. A, a more scientific approach started in the 19th century with these Victorian amateur fossil hunters uh, who had various jobs in the Raj at that time. And they, they got together in the foothills of uh, uh, the Himalaya. They found each other and they used dynamite if they had to, and they blasted open uh, acres of rock and they found the most amazing menagerie of early prehistoric mammals, fishes, and turtles. And this shocked the Victorian intelligentsia back in London uh, because it proved that the Himalayas, first of all, were quite young and the existence of fish and turtles uh, suggested that the, somewhere there was an ocean uh, knocking around when the foothills were formed. A colleague of theirs called Richard Strachey, uh, also an amateur geologist, uh, in those days everybody did everything, he set himself the task of making the first geological traverse from north to south through the Himalayas. And incidentally, uh, Richard Strachey, he was the father of Lytton Strachey, the first of many literary connections between uh, geology in the Himalaya and uh, English literature. Uh, Richard Strachey walked from south to north straight across the Himalaya, one of the first people to ever do it. And he noted, as you can see in these beautiful diagrams, which uh, excite geologists even to this day, you can see that the strata is continuously heading north and dipping under the strata in front. And this is very characteristic of the Himalayas and was first noted by Richard Strachey. He got as far as this is the northernmost point that he reached. He'd crossed the Himalayan uh, main divide, the, the main mountains, and he'd reached the sacred mountain of Mount Kailash surveyed the height of it and from this point he headed back south again but you it's an interesting picture because you can see the natural uh, topology of Tibet he's now in Tibet it's very arid it's very flat and it's very high so the height here would be about 5,000 meters very different from where he came from and geologists would get uh, attached to any expedition going into the area at all. And this is a famous picture of uh, the members of the 1921 Everest Reconnaissance Expedition uh, featuring uh, the most famous climber here is Mallory who was lost on Everest three years later. And all these are well-known climbers of the era except for this man uh, who was Alexander Heron who was the geologist who was attached to the expedition to try and figure out the geology of the uh, surrounding Tibetan landscape. And uh, Heron got into the bad books of the monks uh, living in Rongbuk Monastery at the bottom of the uh, northern side of Everest. He was observed digging up rocks from the mountain as geologists are wont to do. And this, uh, uh, offended the monks. They said it would uh, uh, disturb the gods at the top of the mountain and uh, create a real problem for Tibet. And sure enough, actually, there was a, um, uh, there was a serious uh, pestilence that went through the country soon afterwards. So uh, geologists had to be very respectful or rather secretive. Um, and uh, uh, he got into a lot of trouble. And in fact, Bhutan, which is the only country in the world that is uh, totally Buddhist, uh, forbids climbers climbing their mountains. That, that stopped many decades ago. Uh, another famous geologist uh, who was attached to the uh, expedition when Mallory uh, disappeared, he was the last man to see Mallory alive, Anne Irving, uh, Noel O'Dell. He climbed to 26,000 feet to take samples of the rock 
uh, as he accompanied the two climbers. And the rock he collected was limestone, which was formed, of course, in an ocean. So that another clue that an ocean was knocking around when the Himalayas somehow materialized. Um, and when I was an undergraduate at Cambridge, I used to meet Odell in the pub uh, after mountaineering get-togethers. He, he would join us, and it was a privilege to, to meet um, such a famous uh, climber and geologist. The geology uh, finally got explained by plate tectonics. And here is Fred Vine, and uh, Drummond Matthews was his uh, uh, co-worker, who worked out the whole theory of plate tectonics, which we take for granted today. Um, and it explains what happened. The, it, the Indian plate started way in the Southern hemisphere. It moved forward and smashed into the Asian plate, dipping under it uh, about 50 million years ago, pushing the, in, the Asian plate up and creating the plateau, the very high plateau of Tibet and then forming the Himalayan mountains. So, in broad strokes, it solved everything. Now, geology, the science of geology is only part of the story here uh, because there is a human story as well. This shows the uh, geological survey of India, which formed in the middle of the 19th century and was a group of eminent uh, geologists, actually many picked from uh, Trinity College, Dublin. <laughs> and. Uh, they did their job and they were very, very active in the Himalayas, but they could not countenance the idea of an Indian being savvy enough to join their esteemed group. Uh, it was a, a very, uh, it was just unheard of. Uh, so even more remarkable was this man who broke that mold. Uh, Dian Wadia was a self-taught geologist. Uh, you can see him here as a young man on the left circled. Uh, he obtained a professorship at the University of Jammu, uh, and he was the first Indian educated Indian geologist to join the survey many years later. Uh, he was a remarkable man. He, uh, on the side, he taught uh, a class on Shakespeare, the works of Shakespeare, and he also spent most of his life circling the Nanga Parbat, the celebrated 8,000 meter peak now in Pakistan, uh, looking at its rocks. And by the time the Geological Survey of India uh, in 1951 said goodbye to most of its uh, Anglo uh, uh, constituents, uh, we find one man here who has another interesting connection, uh, a man jo called John Alden, who did extraordinary geological explorations in the Himalayas, uh, who is the brother of W.H. Alden, uh, he was offered the uh, directorship of the survey, said, no, it was time for an Indian, and uh, he came home. So uh, the Himalayas are very, very active. <clears throat> and uh, the, the story of the earthquakes continues to this day. And uh, of course, the dream, of course, is to predict when they're gonna happen, which at the moment is simply not possible. This picture shows uh, another trek we did uh, through a very remote area of uh, Northwest Nepal, which is in Tibetan Buddhist country. So you don't need to go to Tibet to uh, experience at depth, the culture of Tibetan Buddhism. Quite by chance, after one week work walking, we came across this deserted monastery, possibly used for the odd pilgrimage every now and then, we camped there one night and then moved on. Uh, it was a small team. My, my wife and I always travel either just the two of us with a, um, a local team of guides and uh, porters and so on. And in this case, uh, we had two Sherpas, uh, Dawa Sherpa on the left and his brother-in-law Pasang on the right. And uh, Dawa on the left uh, started life as a monk, uh, which is very common among Sherpa families. Uh, he left when he was a teenager to earn a living, and uh, he was a remarkable guy. It, very sadly, he died uh, three years later on Everest. In fact, whenever you're traveling with Sherpas, you're always, uh, you're always being acquainted with deaths of people in their family. Uh, it's, a, it, it's just part of their life. And uh, uh, Dawa led us first of all, across this very remote part of Nepal. It was a, a walk that took seven weeks under tent. And 
we would come down into valleys, uh, very remote, very rarely visited. In fact, one village we visited had never seen a Westerner before. And he would take us into the monasteries and show us the scriptures of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, which you can see arranged in those racks behind him. And he would try and explain the religion to us, uh, which was very difficult. We, we didn't really have a common language. And in spite of traveling so often to the Himalayas, I still don't really speak Nepali, um, but he did his best. And uh, he aroused in me a, a need to really get to grips with the uh, Tibetan Buddhist religion. Uh, on the way out, we passed these caves cut into cliffs, uh, which would have been used for uh, meditation. And we could even climb into one of these cells. You can see on the left, there's a Porter Karma, who actually only spoke Tibetan, uh, sitting in one of those cells. So the whole area is steeped in Tibetan Buddhism. So when did it start? Well, of course, Buddhist Buddha lived uh, in 500 BC, but Buddhism didn't uh, come to Tibet until the late eighth century. And it was brought by this man uh, who I'll, I won't um, uh, mispronounce his first name, Guru Rinpoche he's known as, and he brought Buddhism from India but a very special type of Buddhism called Vajrayana, which uh, promises to allow people to reach the state of Nirvana in one lifetime, rather than being reborn multiple times on the way, on the way there. And Guru Rumpanchi is known throughout the Himalaya. He, he's he's uh, sort of a second Buddha to uh, all Buddhists in the Himalaya region. And his presence is felt everywhere. And just here's one example. This is a very famous monastery in Bhutan near Paro. And he is reputed to have arrived here on the back of a tigress. And he uh, founded this, uh, this uh, monastery, um, which we visited when we were trekking in Bhutan. Now, when you look at a monastery like this, you have to be forewarned that in fact, uh, they're built entirely of wood and they burn down periodically. So actually this monastery burned down quite, quite recently and then of course it was rebuilt. So um, Guru Rinpoche brought this very esoteric type of Buddhism called Vajrayana into Tibet. And if we fast forward, uh, actually almost a thousand years, we find Tibet is a country which is matured, it's, uh, rather than being the belligerent state that it was before Buddhism arrived, they were very aggressive people. Uh, it has become uh, uh, totally uh, Buddhist and the Dalai Lama uh, shown here, this is the, a meeting of the fifth Dalai Lama in the 17th century with the Chinese emperor, the second Chinese emperor in the Manchu dynasty. This is taking place in Beijing the Dalai Lama has traveled there with 5,000 attendants. And the relationship is one of almost equals here. The Dalai Lama provides the spiritual content of the Chinese emperor's life, but the Chinese emperor in return offers some governmental sort of secular administration to Tibet. So it's a sort of, um, it's, the, it's known as patron and priest. The, the Chinese is the patron and the Dalai Lama is the priest. And this is the state of affairs that continues for many years and it provides the basis for the Chinese now feeling as though they have the right to occupy Tibet. Now, none of this of course was known to the West. And the first inkling well, the first person to, to, to witness any, either the relationship between the Chinese and the Tibetans or understand the nature of Tibetan Buddhism were Jesuit and Capuchin ministry, uh, missionaries sent to the subcontinent and a few of them were sent to Tibet by Pope Clement XI. And one of them was called Ippolito de Sidere. He was a Jesuit and he traveled to Lhasa from 
Italy, uh, an amazing journey, uh, ship to Goa, uh, overland from Goa to Delhi, and then this very circuitous route from Delhi to Lhasa. And uh, Desideri was a very intelligent man. He learned a little bit of Tibetan. He tried to get to grips with the Vajrayana brand of Buddhism. Uh, and uh, he became very well connected. And he wrote a diary, <clears throat> uh, and this is one page of his diary where he's trying to write down the Tibetan script and uh, get to grips with its meaning. He returned to Italy <clears throat> and due to an argument with the Pope, uh, his presence was sort of, uh, he was de de declared persona non grata and his diary, were, they refused to publish his diary and it was only actually discovered in the 20th century, which meant that the mysteries of Tibetan Buddhism and what was on earth was going on in Tibet was a total mystery. Uh, and it was sorted out to a certain extent by two uh, Asiatic Asian scholars in the Raj. Hodgson was, a, uh, was the resident in Kathmandu uh, struggling with some Vajrayana texts in a strange language he couldn't understand. And Wilson was a Sanskrit expert in Calcutta, who was very conversant with the original Buddhist texts that were used in India before Buddhism was wiped out in India. And the two of them struggled together to understand, first of all, the Tibetan language, and secondly, the Vajrayana um, uh, type of Buddhism that was prevalent in Tibet. And the, the language problem was finally resolved by uh, an extraordinary Hungarian called Kosoma de Koros, who for reasons only known to himself, he walked from Hungary to a remote area in Ladakh, north of Delhi, uh, a small monastery called Zangla. He walked there on foot, penniless, wearing uh, just the clothes he stood up in. And when he got to Zangla, which is here, it's a very remote spot, even when we visited. You can see my wife in the top right part of the picture, uh, sitting in a small cell at the top of that monastery. And Kosoma de Koros uh, spent two years there with a monk, putting together the Tibetan language versus actually English. And he finally ended up in Calcutta with Wilson, the man I showed you previously, and his, uh, his uh, dictionary was published. And that gradually started unlocking uh, the uh, history of Tibet and the history of Tibetan Buddhism. And from then on, a, a whole range of, of extraordinary characters that we now call Tibetologists traveled to Tibet to understand the language, to speak the language in most cases, uh, to uh, look at the artwork, to note the artwork, and to come to grips with the culture of Tibet. And the most famous is Giuseppe Tucci, who you see here, and you can see him crossing a very important pass into Tibet in 1931. And he was an extraordinary scholar. He was also a protege of Mussolini, and uh, he somehow managed to, uh, uh, rescue his reputation after the Second World War and carry on working. And then finally, uh, the Dalai Lama, uh, who I'm sure you're aware, escaped at one point from Tibet to India. He set himself up in the foothills where he consolidated the culture of Tibet around him. But he was helped by several remarkable men. And the most extraordinary is this man on the left, Gene Smith, who's an American. He had been studying Tibetan Buddhism since he was a young man. He ended up in India and uh, he got a job. The Library of Congress, the US Library of Congress had an office in Delhi. He joined it and he used uh, money that the Indians owed uh, the Americans for aid. He used the money to accumulate manuscripts from all the refugees coming out of Tibet and catalog them and uh, uh, promulgate them through the the uh, the, the uh, diaspora of uh, Tibetans that were now exiting Tibet, and he accumulated over a hundred thousand religious texts from Tibet. They're now on the internet, uh, and so uh, 
he, he's one of the unsung heroes of Tibetan culture. Now, this is a map of Nepal and uh, the area where we were walking, I showed previously, is the this area in light blue at the top. And this is all Tibet, this is all Buddhist. The, the top slice of Nepal is all Buddhist. The Sherpas come from this area. We were traveling at where I showed you up here. But you can see uh, in this country, Nepal, th there are hundreds of different tribes, hundreds of different languages. And uh, this is, a, in fact, a very simplified map. And the, the, tr the tribes on the left are Hindu, and the tribes on the right, which include the Sherpas, are uh, non-Hindu and of all sorts of different religious beliefs. Uh, the Sherpas are Buddhist, but many of these are um, animist uh, and of various different kinds. And the Gurkhas, uh, as a matter of interest, are recruited from these tribes here, uh, especially the Magar and the Gurung. So the, the, the Nepal is a hodgepodge of different tribes, beliefs, with a majority, particularly in the lowlands down here, of Hindu castes. And this has created a problem for governing Nepal. And the first person to really put his hands around everybody and try and create a sort of homogeneous nation, if you like, was this man, Jung Bahadur Rana. And he was a general working for the royal family because there was still a king, there was a, a royal uh, lineage at this time, but they had become very weak. And Jung Bahadur Rana took his opportunity and told the royal family to stay in their palaces and do absolutely nothing, and he would take over the country, which he did, and his descendants carried on ruling the country for another hundred years. And he was the first ruler of Nepal to travel outside Nepal. He visited uh, Britain, he visited France, and when he went back to Nepal, he made, uh, he made a big effort to put everybody in their slot. It's sort of like a jigsaw puzzle. And what you see here is a, a, a very long caste system from top to bottom. So top is Brahmin, which you would expect. And then as you go down, all the different tribes are slotted in somehow until you get down to the impure castes and then finally the untouchable castes. So the entire legal system of Nepal was manufactured by uh, the Ranas to respect this uh, hierarchy of, 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 of people. And it's interesting that you can see Muslims and Europeans uh, don't get a very good deal. They're way down the, the list here. Um, and so this is how he forced it. And uh, at the top of the ladder, of course, they liked the good life. And having been to Europe, he built a massive palace called the Singer Durbar with hundreds and hundreds of rooms decked out as you would normally see in the crown. And uh, he also liked his motor cars, which had to be uh, carried into the country uh, because there were almost no roads in the Kathmandu Valley. Uh, but no problem, you just hire 96 porters and uh, you find your way in. The Ranas ruled like potentates <laughs> until 1950, when the king screwed up his courage, he escaped from his palace, and he flew to India, where he had a meeting with Nehru on the right here, this is the king, and uh, with him is a uh, the most important uh, insurgent at that time in Nepal called Kerala. And Kerala and the king persuaded Nehru to help them uh, basically uh, get rid of the Rana dynasty and reestablish the monarchy in Nepal, which they did. Uh, and everybody, of course, was hopeful that this would create a change in society. It would uh, provide a better environment for the peasant working in the fields, in the, in the, in the mountains. 
But in fact, uh, it didn't make any difference at all. The king uh, went back, the Ranas ceased to exist as a power, and uh, the king enjoyed just the life that the Ranas had before. And this is a classic example. The Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh visited 1961. Uh, the Queen is on the first elephant, the King is on the second, and the Duke of Edinburgh is on the third. And then they had a, a good old uh, hunting session and the Duke of Edinburgh shot dead a tiger and everybody had a wonderful time. And meanwhile, the peasants were living as they always had. Uh, this is a picture that I took on a, uh, a trek in the very, very far west of Nepal, uh, which happened to be at harvest time in, in the autumn. And traditionally, the whole, all the families would go out into the field, they'd all live out there together. But they owed almost certainly 50% of their produce to their landowner. None of these people would own the land. And if the, if the weather was bad and the, the, the harvest was poor, they would have to give a proportionately more harvest to their landowner and keep less for themselves. So the, the penury of the peasantry at the bottom of that list of castes I showed you earlier was uh, appalling. And this prompted a, a revolution in the country uh, by a, a group of Maoists led by this man who goes by the nom de guerre Prashanda, which means fierce on the right. And over a period of 15 years, he, uh, he assembled all the untouchables, the women, the, the people who had no rights, he armed them and he basically fought a war against the king's troops. And in the end, he prevailed and the king was ousted and uh, Prashanda took over. And the only reason I have this photo on the right is because I got to know his personal photographer who is on the left with me in a hotel in uh, Kathmandu. And the photographer, uh, Shreshra, he traveled with Prashanda for those 15 years incognito, taking pictures the whole time. And if they had been discovered, then everybody would have known what Prashanda looked like. Nobody knew what he looked like for 15 years. He was in the jungle, he was in the mountains uh, fighting the king's troops. But in the end, he prevailed and he and his friends took over the government of Nepal. And uh, it shows uh, some of his troops uh, it's a women's brigade. Uh, it, it was a bloody battle. And if you happen to be traveling in West Nepal at the time, particularly, you had to be very careful. On the 11th of June, 2008, Prashanda prevailed and the king quit. This is the king, by the way, the only survivor of the famous massacre of the royal family in Kathmandu in 2001 a very unpopular king, so that helped Prashanda, but this is the last press conference he ever gave as a king. What's happened since? Well, unfortunately, not much. Uh, Prashanda and his uh, colleagues slipped into what I would say is the classic sort of uh, uh, corruption infested uh, style of government that Nepal has always been used to, and a third of the national income comes from young Nepalis flying out to Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and Bahrain, and providing the workforce for, for building uh, football stadiums and, and the like. So and then of course we had the earthquake, uh, so it goes on. So Nepal is a beautiful place, but the people still uh, have, a, have a sort of a, a, a bad history of government, I would say. Um, now I'm just switching tracks for, for my last topic, which is uh, politics. And we're now back to when I very first went to the Himalayas. <clears throat> In 1965, I was a student at Cambridge uh, this was a student expedition to Kashmir, to an area that had never been visited before. Uh, there were actually no maps that we could use, so we had to make our own maps. And we were climbing in Kashmir, uh, a mountain called Brahma, which is a bit over 6,000 meters high, which by Himalayan standards is actually not very high. 
but it was a difficult mountain and you can see it doesn't look very friendly. And we almost got to the top. <clears throat> uh, and uh, in fact, we went back uh, six years later for another attempt. We got even nearer the top, but we didn't quite get to the top. And it was finally climbed by Chris Bonington and Nick, Nick Escort. But in 1965, we, we had a very satisfactory time. You know, we, we, we did our best. We came down from the mountain uh, and we exited down through the foothills onto the plains of Kashmir. And to our surprise, we found ourselves in the middle of a battle. Because in 1965, the Pakistanis had decided that they would try and take the whole of Kashmir for themselves. Kashmir got divided into two during partition. Uh, so there's an Indian part and the Pakistani part. And the Pakistanis infiltrated thousands of insurgents into the Indian part of Kashmir, hoping to destabilize the country and allow the Pakistanis to take over. It should be noted that the majority of the population in Indian Kashmir are Muslim. So there was some justification for this. The battle was bloody. There were thousands killed on each side. There was a tank battle on the Punjab plains that was the largest since the Second World War. And the net result was that everybody had to go back to where they started and uh, basically no territory was gained or lost by either party. Now, we found ourselves in the middle of this battlefield. We retreated to Delhi, to our hosts in Delhi. And I'm showing you this rather grainy photo um, because it's quite interesting. This man here, our host is General Dubey, who was the engineer in chief of the Indian army at the time. His wife was our mother's substitute in Delhi. Uh, their son, Suman Dubey, became the uh, press attache to Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi. Uh, Babli, his sister, Babli, uh, later married a man who became the Secretary General of the Commonwealth. Uh, Charlie, uh, who's the leader of our expedition, became Bonington's doctor on all his major expeditions. And Simon and Dilsha were uh, climbing companions to this day. So we uh, were very lucky to um, be able to recuperate in such luxury in Delhi. General Dubey had a, an interesting job. Uh, he was, he'd founded an organization called the Border Roads Organization. So for the army, uh, the roads in the Himalayan region were, and they were incredibly, they're incredibly difficult to maintain due to avalanches, uh, earthquakes, and so on. And this is a typical scenario. You're driving along a road in the Himalayas and, um, it's obstructed by some avalanche and you simply have to get out with your own bare hands and repair it. And uh, Border Roads Organization, BRO, liven up your life with uh, these rather charming uh, sayings on the side of the road to keep you uh, supposedly driving safely. Um, drive like hell and you'll be there. Check your nerves on my curves. They get quite racy sometimes, but um, so Dubé had the um, distinction of starting this organization. Uh, just for comparison, on the other side in Tibet, there is no problem with the roads. Tibet is quite flat. It's very high. It's very arid, as I said before, actually quite near Everest, uh, where there is obviously no strategic problem. Now, the back to Pakistan and India fighting over uh, Kashmir, this is a could be another talk that would last three hours. <clears throat> but believe it or not, they can they fight about every single inch of the red line here, which is called the line of control separating the two parts. And in 1984, they started fighting about an area, a very remote area up here, the Siachen Glacier. This is the Siachen Glacier. So can you imagine uh, this is one of the battlefields that separate Indian and Pakistani troops. They have to become skilled mountaineers. And there's no doubt in anybody's mind that more people have been have died in this theater of war from altitude sickness than being shot by the enemy. Now, the other big political story here is between India and uh, China. 
It, Mao Zedong came to power in 1949 and almost immediately he started uh, infiltrating Tibet with his People's Liberation Army. Uh, Nehru had come into power in 1947, so they, were, they had both acquired their countries, if, uh, if you like, uh, about the same era, and this brought them together. They were both leaders of an independent, uh, they're now, they, they got rid of their colonial masters, uh, whether it was Japanese or British, and uh, they struck up this friendship, uh, uh, which was sealed with this agreement in 1954. And uh, they were so close that Nehru chose to ignore the infiltration of Tibet by Mao's troops because he just didn't want to upset his big friend Mao. And uh, Nevertheless, the Chinese troops were invading uh, Tibet and Mao's strategy was just to do it very gently. Uh, don't disturb the uh, culture of Tibet. We'll come to that later. Uh, just keep things, uh, just, just take over the country, but let the Dalai Lama uh, manage his uh, people uh, and the religion in the way he wants. Nevertheless, there was some uh, uh, recommended re-education uh, I think is the right word for the Dalai Lama, who you can see here in Beijing in 1956. Here's the Dalai Lama, young Dalai Lama. Here is the Panchen Lama, who is the second uh, most important Lama in Tibet. Chow Enlai, who is the, at that time, I think the prime minister of China. Mao Zedong and Li Chao, uh, who had another very high position. And they had invited the two lamas to come to Beijing, make friends, and basically, uh, hopefully brainwash them into accepting the Chinese presence in Tibet. Meanwhile, back in Lhasa, we see the Dalai Lama, he's now come back. Uh, the Panchen Lama is here, and everybody seems sort of happy. Uh, there's a Chinese official taking a guard of honor uh, the troops are actually Tibetans dressed in Chinese provided uniforms. But uh, unbeknownst to the Chinese, the, the Dalai Lama's elder brother, Gyalo Thondup, has left Tibet. He fled to India. He had actually been educated partially uh, in the US, but he knew the West. He'd come back to Tibet uh, full of ideas but he had given up. He, he realized the Chinese were there to stay and he recruited the CIA to come and help uh, uh, trigger uh, an insurgency uh, to push the Chinese out of Tibet. And the CIA threw money at him uh, hand over fist. They, they uh, founded a training camp in Colorado. They'd fly uh, Tibetans out to Colorado, train them in arms communication, uh, explosives or what have you. And then they were shipped back. Uh, here, here is a band of them. They were called the Kampa Resistance Fighters. And they were based primarily in an enclave in the very north of Nepal called Mustang, uh, which you can see here. We took this on one of our treks, uh, Pasang on the left and the Annapurna behind us. And they infiltrated Tibet, there were thousands of them. Uh, I think there were about 5,000 stationed right here where you can see, and they could slip over the border into Tibet, uh, create havoc. And in fact, at one point it looked as though uh, they might actually push the Chinese out. And as a result, things got very bad. <clears throat> and there came a point when the Tibetan hierarchy realized that the Dalai Lama had to get out of there. He had to leave Lhasa and he secretly fled and he, his, his caravan managed to avoid uh, Chinese in interception as they headed for the, um, the boundary between Tibet and India. And they finally made it into India in March, 1959, where Nehru was basically waiting for him to say, you can stay here. You know, Nehru was not about to throw the Dalai Lama out of India. And that is the reason why the Dalai Lama is now installed in Dharamsala in the foothills of India. So the Dalai Lama was safe. 
and he precipitated a, a, a mass exodus of, of lamas and refugees from Tibet. And this angered Mao Zedong hugely. He felt he had been betrayed by Nehru. He couldn't believe that Nehru was now hosting the Dalai Lama. And as a result, the relationship between Nehru and uh, uh, Mao Zedong disintegrated totally until 1962, when the Chinese decided to test Nehru militarily. And the crux of this was the following. In, on the east of the Himalaya, there's an area here that was claimed by India, and then uh, the Chinese decided they would claim it as well. And in the west, in Kashmir, there was this strange knob of a very high deserted plateau called the Aksai Chin, that also both parties claimed. And Chow and Lai came to Nehru and said, um, he said, you, Nehru, you can keep that area on the east, but we'll take that area, tip for tap. How about that? And Nehru said, no, uh, I, India can claim to both of them. And so at that point, the Chinese lost their patience. And just to prove that they could do it, they advanced with their troops from the border down almost to the Brahmaputra in a matter of weeks. And they destroyed the Indian army, which you can see here struggling with the terrain south of the Himalayan chain. You remember north in Tibet, very easy. Here it's extremely tough territory. And Nehru was humiliated. And in the end, the Chinese having made their advance immediately retreated back to where they started and said, okay, you keep that and we'll keep that. And really Nehru couldn't say anything. And that is the status today. And since then, the tension between China and India has never gone away. And there are endless uh, skirmishes on the border. Uh, you can read about them uh, even in very recent times. In fact, the most recent news I think came yesterday which is that uh, they've in fact agreed in one particular spot where they were fighting to sort of uh, just separate for a while. But the military buildup on both sides of the Himalayan chain is spectacular. This is the Chinese infra military infrastructure built up uh, most of it quite recently. And you can see there is a lot around that area I was showing you just now. And here's Aksai Chin, there's a lot around here. There's not so much around Nepal, which doesn't seem to bother the Chinese so much. And on their side, the Indians are massively engaged as well. So they, they're facing each other. They frequently have skirmishes up in Ladakh. They have skirmishes here in Sikkim. Their Chinese are eating away at Bhutan. And they're also, um, they're also infiltrating Nepal in a very subtle way. So the, the relationship between China and Nepal is uh, amicable. And the Chinese are slowly driving roads from the plateau of Tibet into Nepal to, to link up with the Nepalese road infrastructure, which is pretty primitive. And uh, in 2019, we, we saw this in action. So my last slide shows you one of these roads that the Chinese are building. The, the, uh, Tibet is just around the corner here. If you, if you climb up to here and then go up here, you get to the frontier very quickly. So the Chinese simply bulldoze their way down and create this road, which by the way, is large enough to take a large truck. And is currently used by yak transport only uh, to, to bring in merchandise from China into the, the very, very remote villages of Nepal at this particular place. To, to get to this point, this is us walking, uh, had taken three weeks. So uh, the Chinese are subtly pushing their way southwards uh, frankly, rather worrying. I, you, I, I can't believe the Nepalese really uh, understand what's going on there. 
So that really is a very, very rapid uh, scratching the surface only survey of my book. Uh, everything I've talked about, the book goes into huge detail. Um, and uh, I, I hope it's uh, been of interest to you and has aroused your interest. Uh, of course, it's available from various bookstores and Amazon, the usual, and also from that website. Um, but I thank you very much for your attention and uh, be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Henry. That was that was, that was so fascinating. Um, we do have a few. If anyone else has a few more, please pop them into the box. We'll answer as many as we can. Um, I think the first one is from Nigel. Um, and he says he made a very brief visit in 1994 to the Hunza Valley in Pakistan. Um, he wonders if you did any trekking in that part of the Karakorams, apologies for my pronunciation, mm -hmm. and what was what is the highest mountain around there? Uh, so I haven't been to Hunza, but we had, we did a family trek in Baltistan, which is just the other side of the uh, Indus, uh, near K2, which is the second highest mountain in the world. And we trekked for three weeks. Uh, this was about 20 years ago. Uh, the children were quite small and I had to carry our smallest the whole way. Uh, we had uh, quite a large uh, group of porters carrying our stuff. Um, and uh, it, it's wonderful country. It's very dry. Uh, and it's very remote. The problem nowadays, if you want to go there, is uh, Pakistan is not exactly safe. And to go there with your whole family is probably um, not advisable, but I, I, I can't wait to go back there. Um, then we've got another one from David, um, who asks, um, he asked what initially inspired you to begin your connection to the Himalaya. Um, why not any other mountain in where? What drew, what drew you there? Oh, well, actually, that's a, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> um, I came from a family where we used to go to the Lake District and North Wales and so on for our holidays. But uh, in 1953, when I was seven years old, uh, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II was coming up and our little village had a fancy dress competition uh, to mark the occasion. And um, my father said, we all knew that the British had sent a, uh, an expedition to Mount Everest that, at that particular time, spring of 1953. And my father said, okay, uh, you three children, uh, I'm gonna dress you up as climbers and you can, uh, you get your, go to the fancy dress and you can be the Everest expedition. And so, so we come the day uh, of the coronation, we dressed up in, in balaclavas, boots. Uh, we found an old piece of rope, we roped together and we tramped through the village to the astonishment of the villagers, went to the fancy dress party and won first prize. And uh, which was two pounds uh, divided between three people who was 13 and fourpence each, which was a fortune. And that inspired me to go to the Himalayas. From that moment onwards, I was going to go to the Himalayas come high or hell or high water. And I'm very lucky that opportunities came my way. So uh, it started that far ago. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> what a good costume. <laughs> um, I've got another one, uh, a few actually. Hang on, two seconds. Um, We've got a few. One from uh, Shayla. Sorry if I could pronounce that wrong. Do the Chinese use Hindu Muslim tensions to their own advantage, do you think? Well, I'm a bit of a cynic. Um, I think they're, they use, like any nation, they'll use anything to their own advantage. Uh, <clears throat> and their attitude to territory, I think, it, it is frequently uh, referred to as the salami technique which is you cut off a thin slice each time and, and basically never retreat. Um, so the, the Aksai Chin, if you remember that funny novel on the top of uh, Kashmir is a very good example. 
that, that was first surveyed by the British in uh, the 19th century and was placed on the map. And the British, first of all, nobody really cared about this piece of territory. There was nobody there and it didn't seem to have any strategic importance. So the British put it on the map. They, they sort of added it to Kashmir. And the Indians inherited it after partition and they did nothing with it either. And they, in fact, they didn't even notice that over the next decade, the Chinese started building roads all over it and uh, putting small military installations uh, along those roads. So, uh, yes, I think the Chinese uh, have a historic uh, um, attitude to, you know, Taiwan. They have an attitude towards to Tibet. Historically, these territories have been managed by them. Not not the religious part of life, but certainly the uh, governing them and defending them from uh, invasion. Because I mean, there's all sorts of things that have gone on in the past. Nepal tried to invade Tibet at one point, and the Kashmiris tried to invade Tibet in the uh, 18th century. So the, the, the Chinese have actually been quite useful to the Tibetans in keeping these invaders out, but they themselves were never inspired to leave and go back to China because they believed that Tibet had always been part of China. So their territorial um, ambitions are sort of so ingrained uh, that I think uh, uh, you'll never get them to to pull back on anything. I, I'm not sure whether that answers the question. Let's leave it at that. Mm. Um, uh, another one. Um, do you have any predictions? Um, I assume this means for Tibet post uh, the current da Dalai Lama. Uh, very good question. Uh, frankly, I have no idea. Uh, I think he's made various pronouncements um what the chinese will definitely aim to do is to pick their own reincarnation okay. they, there's a sort of uneasy uh, truce between the tibetan culture in tibet and the chinese government um and their technique which by the way is not a a, a new one the um that their technique would be to find their own reincarnation that they can con control. And clearly it's not gonna be someone who grew up in India or anywhere else. Um, but I showed you a picture of the fifth Dalai Lama visiting Beijing. The sixth Dalai Lama uh, who followed him was uh, a hopeless character who, who wasn't interested in being the Dalai Lama. So the Chinese, the Manchu Chinese at that point whisked him away to China and sort of dealt with him. And they themselves found the seventh Dalai Lama and reintroduced him into Lhasa to the joy of the crowd. I mean, they were, they were extremely happy to have a Dalai Lama back again. So the Chinese have been manipulating the Dalai Lama for hundreds of years, not, not all the time, but when it, when it counts. Mm. So I think that when the Dalai Lama dies, the Chinese will have a, a, a plan B that will come into action instantaneously and, and it'll be them choosing their own and there will be this fight between the Dalai Lama chosen by the Chinese and the Dalai Lama somehow recognized as a reincarnation um, elsewhere, but um, I'm guessing. Gosh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think we've got two more. Um, so uh, Sandra asks, what wildlife did you see on your travels? Any snow leopards, for example? No, so uh, disappointing. Uh, no leopards, I'm afraid. Um, you see uh, wild horses, wild goats, uh, a certain amount of um, bird life. Yes, it would have been, uh, but we've seen uh, bear tracks, uh, we've seen uh, uh, spores 
of leopards. You can tell it's a leopard because the spore will contain yak fur. They kill yaks. Um, but the, uh, the non-wildlife, of course, is very interesting. Living and working with yaks is quite an experience. Uh, and on the uh, one trek that took seven weeks, we were fluctuating between having humans to carry for us, horses to carry for us, some donkeys, some yaks. Uh, it was all over the place. Um, one interesting piece of fauna that you find in the Himalayas is called Yasa Gomba. And this is a, a um, caterpillar that is killed by a fungal parasite and it lives in the grasslands at, at altitudes between about four and a half thousand meters and five and a half thousand meters. And this is collected by the locals. And most of it is sold to China because it's considered to be an aphrodisiac. <clears throat> and it is worth a fortune. Uh, a kilo of Yasagomba sells, used to sell for $10,000. And so the harvesting of Yasagomba is uh, highly competitive and there have been murders between villages in Nepal because people have been poaching on Yasagomba territory. And um, we would encounter, you know, Yasagomba expeditions, which would be teams of um, uh, locals with their yaks living really high up because it, it, this, for whatever reason, this is not found at low altitudes. Um, oh, we've had one more. Okay, two more now, and then we'll, I think we're done. Um, somebody asked, when did the US cease trying to destabilize Tibet? Or is this, if this is too long a question? Uh, that's a very good question. So uh, it was during uh, Kennedy, the Kennedy administration that it was ex particularly active. And uh, I, I can't date it exactly, but at some point, the US uh, foreign interests shifted elsewhere and they lost interest in, in this Tibetan insurrection. And particularly when Nixon went to China, there was no way that the CIA could be seen to be financing uh, a war in Tibet. So, um, I'm afraid I can't answer that question exactly. Uh, I, I know how to find it. It's actually in my book, I think, but uh, I just can't remember the date, but it, Excellent. Excellent. it peaked and then it gradually, um, <laughs> it gradually um, uh, disappeared. Yep. Brilliant. I think just the last question, which we were talking about before we started the webinar, um, is what are your plans for your next trek when you're able to go? Um, so I, we were meant to be going to Sikkim in 2020 uh, with a, a professor from Cambridge, uh, a very well-known guy called uh, John Gurdon. And uh, that of course was canceled. And then uh, we have a trek planned to fill in one gap in our traverse of the whole Himalaya range. But really, uh, even though it looks as though we've covered the whole range, in between there are delicious holes that we can fill uh, until uh, I'm incapable of putting one foot in front of the other. So uh, it could it could be anywhere, and it depends uh, very much on um, our blessed friend COVID. Brilliant. Oh, well, that was fascinating, Henry. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you to everyone Pleasure. who joined us this afternoon. Um, I think we'll leave it there. Um, we have just gone over an hour. So um, brilliant. Um, uh, go and purchase uh, Henry's book for if you want to find out more, uh, I think is the <laughs> answer to the last questions if we've missed them. So, um, but thank you so much for joining us. And um, thank you. Can't wait to read more. Brilliant. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thank you.